going to go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse number 10. And be reading it from the New King James Version, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6, verse number 10. And the Bible says like this, and if you're able to stand up out of reverence for the Word of God, that will be greatly appreciated. If not, that is perfectly fine. The Bible says like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can we say that one more time together? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. This morning, as the Holy Spirit shall guide me, I want to continue our conversation that we've been having about the second coming of Jesus Christ over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, if in fact, I believe this is my sixth or seventh week, we had an in-depth search through the scriptures about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, I will tell you that we are nowhere near, if you are a rookie to this conversation, or I would say if you are in a place where you would say that, hey, I have not had a good study on, this, on, on, that, on that particular type of topic, I would want to tell you that this is not the... Um, uh, this is not the all in all of the of eschatology. There's so much more things that we have to learn. But at the same time, I have no intention to sit here and uh, and, and uh, uh, just make you filled with so much information if we are not in a position to experience that in our life. Over the course of the next uh, few months or years, whenever the Lord allows us, we will go and revisit this topic. But at the same time, you have to understand one thing, that whatever you do and however you do things, that you are in a position to view the world through the lens of the Scriptures. You have to view the news through the lens of the Scriptures. You have to view everything through the lens of the Scriptures. Don't care what Joe Biden says. Don't care what Donald Trump says don't care what CNN or Fox News got to say all things that you do has to be viewed through the lens of the scripture because there are a lot of prophecies that need to be fulfilled and all pretty much all of those prophecies have been fulfilled there's only a few more prophecies to be fulfilled it doesn't matter who is going to be in the White House in the next term but one thing I will tell you the Word of God says that the hearts of the kings are like rivers in the hands of the Almighty God and re understand and realize that God is doing some amazing things in these days uh, in, in spite of uh, a, a lot of negativity that we can say one of the things that you got to understand the other day uh, our president was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize now I know you're all about to throw rocks at me but that's not the intent I'm not trying to lead you in any way shape or form but the reason why he's getting a Nobel Peace Prize is because he was able to broker a, uh, a, a peace dialogue between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and that conversation as a matter of fact over the course of the last few weeks they have exchanged a lot of bilateral relations they flew over uh, uh, flew over uh, the planes to both countries and you have to understand what that means it has been almost nearly 70 two years since such a relationship even existed so you got to realize again looking through the lens of scripture not the lens of politics you got to understand one thing th that is major like I taught you a few weeks ago that the more of Gog and Magog and the war and the maps that I showed you, you got to understand that there is a, 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 a coalition that is going on above Israel, above Syria, around that area there is a coalition that is going on of 10 nations to make sure that they can come again against Israel. But at the same time, you also know that God says that Israel is not going to be just left alone, that they are also going to have allies. They're going to have unlikely allies as we read in the book of Ezekiel. And you know how in the book of Ezekiel, we talked about the land of Sheba and the land of Dedan. And the land of Dedan, what was Dedan, now what is the United Arab Emirates, have come to the, uh, come in relationship with Israel. And I believe this Tuesday, they're going to be signing a peace accord. As soon as that happened, for they decided that they were going to exchange uh, two flights. One from Israel, from Jerusalem to Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of UAE. And also a flight from the UAE back to Israel. Now, you've got to understand what thing 
I wish I had the map here, but one of the things that would happen is that the Israeli airlines were not allowed to ever use the airspace of the Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia. But because of this bilateral conversation that was going on, for the first time, Saudi Arabia decided that it was okay for Israel to send their airplane it through the airspace of Saudi Arabia to, um, to the United Arab Emirates. You've got to understand, these are historical moments. Just like the Berlin Wall came down, these are historical moments, and you have to keep that in mind. As a matter of fact, yesterday they announced that there is a small, small country called Bahrain, which is, uh, which is north of um, UAE, and that is the land of Sheba. I mean, we talk about the land of Sheba. We talked about this back in Ezekiel 38 and the land of Sheba. And guess what? They want to start a conversation with Israel as well. As a matter of fact, they have been having conversations. And now they are also at a place where they want to sign a peace accord as well. Guess who is behind all of these conversations? It is Saudi Arabia, the land that is against the Jews. The Muslims that are against the Jews are coming to create a coalition of their own right there in the Middle East. So what I'm trying to tell you in all of this is this, that you need to keep an, a close eye on what is going on in the world to make sure that you are aware of all the things that is going on in the world. Because one thing remains a fact. It doesn't matter who is reigning. It doesn't matter who is in charge. That the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is very, very near. As a matter of fact, we will probably experience that in our generation because the Bible says that this generation, Matthew 24 says, that this generation shall see the coming of the Lord. And you have to understand there's a lot more things that is in Matthew 24 that I did not go through because that is all has to do with the uh, times of the tribulation and because I have no intention to be here during the tribulation, I have no intention to teach you about the tribulation. All four of you, gotcha. At least I, I just wanted some company to come with me. Um, all right, but at the same time, I want you to understand that realize that some crazy things are going to happen in the days ahead, and these are all, like Jesus says, the birth pains of the coming of Jesus Christ. So when you hear all this news and say that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, the church should rejoice because you've got to understand, before it goes to hell in a handbasket, I've got a, a, a ticket bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. I've I've got places to go. I got things to see. I've got a heaven to rejoice and let whatever happen on this earth, let it happen according to the will of the Father. Now, having said that, I do want to end, end this conversation today by saying, as it is in heaven. What is heaven like? Now, I know the Bible says like this, that word, uh, the, the, the word of God says that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said like this, that you ought to pray like this, that your kingdom will come, the kingdom of heaven would come, and that thy, king, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you ever prayed that prayer before? Lift and show your hands. Question for you, what is heaven like that you're asking to come down? God's will. What else? Righteousness, peace, gotcha. Anything else? The kingdom of God to come. So it is important that all, while all these are correct answers, that there is more to heaven. And when you're calling heaven down, it is important that you realize what heaven should look like on earth. And not only that, you also should be understanding of the fact that you are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven and therefore how you ought to act on earth. Are we good? So it is important that you realize that when we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that you have a very good idea of what heaven is like. By no means am I going to exhaust a whole conversation on heaven in, in one day. By no means am I doing that. But I just want to give you a small pointers about all the things that are happening. One of the things I also want to tell you, last week we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about the great white throne judgment and what happens and all of those things. In all of that, we were excited to hear the fact that, you know what, we are going to be with the king and there is no judgment, there is no none of this stuff. But at the end of the day, you got to also understand one thing. I did tell you one thing that you have to realize that the, all of the church shall not go to heaven. 
I, when I say that church, I'm going to use that term very loosely. I'm not talking about like the church that Jesus wanted, but people who call themselves to be church. Not everybody's going to heaven. And I told you last week when we ended that conversation that there's going to be three judgments that we have to see at the great white throne judgment. And one of those judgments is about the judgment, about the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. The parable of the ten virgins. Then from there, we talked about how we are stewards. The, the judgment about the stewards, how we maintain stewardship. The, the, the parable of the, of, of the servants with the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent. And then from there, I talked to you about the fact the last judgment we would have to face would be the judgment about our friendships how we maintain friendships how do we keep our friendship that how would God wants us to see things and how God wants us to have the eye of Jesus when we deal with people and when we deal with situations just like the king of kings and the lord of lords the one who has created the entire world would cry at the tomb of Lazarus Jesus is expecting a level of compassion passion from our end so that we would understand and realize what it is like to be in somebody else's shoes. Jesus did not cry because Lazarus was dead. Jesus cried because everybody else was crying for Lazarus. He knew Lazarus was about to come out. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, hey, guys, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's what I would do because I'm about to show something that y'all haven't seen before. But what did Jesus do? He became part of the crowd. He knew that Lazarus was not dead. Lazarus is sleeping. He's about to wake up. But on the flip side of the coin, he became part of the crowd. So we have to show compassion in our relationships or in our friendships with each other. Now, having said that, I also told you that there is not going to be any judgment for the church. Have, I mean, what the rewards are going to be like and all those things that we talked about last week. But I do did, did end this conversation by saying that there is a 50, according to Jesus, this is not things that I'm making up. According to Jesus, there's a 50-50 shot that people will not make it to heaven from the church. Okay? I told you about how two people are going to be sleeping together. One is gone and the other remains two are grinding one stays the other one remain there's a 50 50 shot that there's 50 percent chance that people in this room will not go to heaven including the pastor so I'm, now we have a club it's cool i have every intention to go to heaven but i just didn't want you to feel lonely for no reason you'll be lonely on that day though. i'm just kidding Okay, now having said that, one of the wrong impressions that I potentially have passed on uh, to in our conversation last week was this, that the church would go and we have nothing to worry about, that everybody might, has a potential to go because somebody asked me a question the other day, said, Pastor, are you saying that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that all of the church will be there. I said, no, the latter part of the conversation, we did say 50%. So for that reason, just to clear that up, I do have one slide that I want to tell you. When you go into the New Testament, that you will see, the Bible says that these people shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. There is 32 different kinds of sins that are found in the New Testament that says that because of this, you will not enter to heaven. I do want to say one thing. Jesus mentioned these things. Paul mentioned these things. Peter mentioned these things. While you might be thinking that we might be talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, true. But on the flip side of the coin, you also have to realize that Paul was talking to the church. So all these jokers ain't going to heaven. All right, so there is, a, there is 32 different sins that are talked, and I put this all, I mean, I worked hard on this one. I put all in alphabetical order and stuff. So uh, uh, these, these 32 sins are the ones we see in the New Testament that says, these are the kind of folks that shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, having said that, it is important that we re have the conversation about what is heaven. Now, the Bible talks about that there is more than one heaven. Good? You agree, don't agree? How many of y'all agree with me that the heaven, the Bible talks about Where do you see that? That there is more than one heaven in the Bible. Where do you see it? The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right? 
So we're not talking about just one. The Bible talks about the fact that there are more than one heaven. As a matter of fact, the first verse, it's a good verse to remember and keep in the back of your head. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there is a, what we would call a first heaven. You will, and we will go into that. There are three different kinds of heavens that are being talked about in the Bible. All right? The, one, of those, one of those heavens don't have um, particular scripture to back it up. But at the same time, there are three different kinds of heavens. To say, there's scripture to back up that there are three heavens. Now, having said that, I do want to tell you there are times when people tell you, I was taken up into the seventh heaven. That is not scriptural. Okay, if you're from California, there's a small little piece of weed that you get. You smoke one of those things, chances of you going to seventh heaven, hey, ninth heaven, tenth heaven possibility, but it depends on the quantity that you take and how you take it. I, not that I have any experience, I've been told. Y'all need a smile, man. We're talking about heaven and you're like, I think you're stuck on the last slide about the 32 sins. Come on, everybody smile. Okay, hey, so. You have to understand one thing, that there's only three heavens that's spoken about in the Bible. All right? Even though the Bible starts off by saying that we created the heavens, you have to understand that there is a, a first heaven. And that first heaven is the kind of heaven that you would see in Psalm 19, verse number 1. Psalm 19, verse number 1 talks about the firmament of the Lord. In other words, when you get out there and look into the skies, guess what? You see the heavens. You will see the stars, the suns, and the moons, and the galaxies, and all these things that you will see. And guess what? That is what the Bible calls as being heaven. All right? That is one aspect of things. That is the first heaven that you see. Now, the second heaven, uh, if you... Maybe. The second heaven is a place that you will see in the book of Ezekiel, and I, this is a scripture to read, that Ezekiel, when Lucifer was kicked out, the Bible says that I tossed him from heaven. All right? That does not mean that Lucifer is in the stars and the, and, and, and the um, uh, moon and the... And, and the does he have power over them? Certain extents? Yes. We talked about that as well. But that's not where his primary residence is. His primary residence is found in the second heaven. This is where the spirit of, 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 of demons and mediums and witchcraft and all these things that we talk about, these are the kind of things that will happen in the second heaven. Again, since these things are very irrelevant to you, let us go to the real heaven. And that is the third heaven. Okay, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse number 2 onwards, that Paul says like this, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. All right, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Now, who was this person? I know a man in Christ. All right? Technically speaking, Paul is talking about himself. He's, not, he's trying to be humble about it. He's being humble about it. Not trying. He's being humble about it. And he says that you got to understand, I had an experience where I was taken up to the third heaven. And when I was taken up to the third heaven, one of the things that I realized in the third heaven was that it was an out-of-body experience and an in, or an in-the-body in experience. I do not know. But I will tell you one thing, that I was caught up to the third heaven. So there you go. Those are the three heavens that you will see in the scriptures. All right? Now, having said that, we are talking about how we want heaven to show up on earth. I'll tell you one thing. The first heaven is something that you can already visibly see from the earth. Do not pray the second heaven to come on the earth. All right? Yes, cool. Man, y'all wake up on the wrong side of the bed or something. Now, the third one is the kind of heaven that you are praying for. That that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when we talk about the rapture, you have to realize one thing. That the church is in a particular situation. 
the church is put, put, uh, caught up in this particular situation that we have been caught up into the third heaven. In other words, when you and I are going up to the heavens, you have to realize that we will be passing by the suns and the moons and the stars. We will be passing through them. And I love this part. We will be passing through second heaven as well. In other words, every devil in hell will be watching me and watching you as we keep on rolling and we keep on moving into the third heaven. Because you know what? There might be some devils that say, I tried to take him down. I tried to take her down. I thought I had them. I, oh, I thought you were in my court. Where are you going? As we keep on rolling and coasting over into the third heaven heaven. I would love to pass through second heaven. If possible, take a slow, a, 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 a slower way to get to third heaven. You know, my, I want to flaunt my stuff while I'm going to third heaven. I'm not going to be like Paul when we pass through second heaven. I'm not going to be humble about it. All righty then, I'm striking out today. So that is what is happening in the third heaven. Now having said that, the next thing that you've got to understand is where the, the greatest divisions of heaven or the greatest understanding of what heaven is like is being mentioned in the book of Revelation. Now I do want to tell you one thing. Revelation is a book like we first read, uh, first heard back in the day was the fact that you are blessed if you read this word and hear this word. Unfortunately there's a lot of people that don't read the book of Revelation either because they don't understand it or because of the fact that they are scared of all the images that is found in the book of Revelation. If you were to break it down, let me tell you something, it's a lot more easier because you will you got to take some time to run right through it don't 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 put it on fast forward and go through revelation you will not get anything but if you take your time i will tell you one thing it will be a blessing into in in the um, in the in, in your reading and for your life as well now you have to realize one thing that when we get to the book of revelation the fact of the matter is that the book of revelation is being split up into three major parts and i'm not going to go and give you a study about the book of revelation that's not my intent i'm just giving you context when you're talking about the three major divisions of the script of the scriptures in the bible in the book of revelation you got to understand all three divisions start with the words that i was in the spirit i was in the spirit I do want to tell you something, child of God. If you want to ever get to heaven, you ought to be a person that is in the Spirit. Not carrying the Spirit, holding the Spirit, talk about the Spirit, that you ought to be one in the Spirit. Now, I'm not telling you that you ought to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to get to heaven, even though that is the greatest way to get to heaven because the Spirit of God is the one that's going to protect you and preserve you while on this earth. But I do want to say that there is also Scripture to back it up this morning that I want to tell you in the book of Revelation chapter 20, that I can say that if you do not have the Spirit of God, that you will not make it to heaven. Okay? So you got to understand one thing. For you to experience heaven and for you to experience heaven on this earth, you have to realize that you ought to be in the Spirit of God. Why, is, why the Spirit of God? you got to understand. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. For you to have love, joy, peace in a chaotic, conflicting world, guess what you need? The Holy Spirit. Are we good? All right. Paul, I mean, I'm sorry, John, John the Revelator says like this, that there is three great divisions in the book of Revelation. All right? First thing that you've got to understand is that in the Spirit on the Lord's day, okay, for you to be a worshiper, you ought to have the Spirit of God. I don't have to give you the... I'm, Trust me, I'm not preaching, I'm teaching, okay? But if I get my preach on, y'all help me out here. But for you to worship and for me to worship, you have to realize that we ought to have the Holy Spirit. Now, you know John was in the Isle of Patmos, and he was in a messed up situation. The boy had nobody near him. He was just taken out of burning oil and put in the Isle of Patmos, scorpions and snakes all around, and he has every reason to say, this is the end of the story. But somehow, while there was no physical clock or a physical cat, calendar his spirit was had a spiritual clock and a spiritual calendar and the bible says that on the lord's day he got up in the spirit he had enough reasons to be upset he had enough reasons to be mad he had enough reasons to be uh, to, to be just depressed and disappointed didn't like the song didn't like the sermon didn't like this didn't like that he had enough reasons but he made sure that on this day even if i am the a one man choir a one man audience and a one man preacher this is the day that the Lord has made and guess what I am going to do I am going to be in the spirit on the Lord's day so you got to understand one thing don't try to come into the house and get the spirit 
As a matter of fact, bring the Spirit with you. The Spirit, not all Spirit, the Spirit with you when you come into the house of God. At that point, it doesn't matter if the praise team is out of key and out of chord, and if you, it doesn't matter if the preacher doesn't know what in the world he's speaking, speaking about. It doesn't matter if, 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 if it's Jojo did not look at you and smile at you. It doesn't matter if Lily did not come, come, come and say hello to you. Hey, it is the Lord's Day. I ain't here to see you. I ain't here to holler at you. I love you, but at the end, at the end of the day, you got to realize I'm in the Lord's house because of the Spirit of God. Now, having said that, you got to understand one thing: that not only was he on the uh, uh, on the Lord's day in the spirit, but the Bible also says like this: that he was in the spirit in heaven. All right. Remember, in the last scripture that we talked about, that he was in the spirit. In other words, and he heard a loud voice as a trumpet. I forgot. I'm sorry. I got a little excited. I forgot a couple of things here. But the Bible says like this in First. Uh, from Revelation chapter 1, verse number 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of the trumpet. you got to understand one thing. For you to hear heaven, you need what? The Spirit. I will leave that at that. Next thing. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. For you to see heaven, you need what? The, come, come on, church. Y'all, this is going to be a dialogue. <laughs> For you to hear heaven, guess what? What you need? The Holy Spirit. If you want to see heaven, what you need? The Holy Spirit. All right? Now, the third division, and you can see all the scriptures, Revelation 4 to uh, chapter 16, verse 21, is the other division. The third division is the one that you got to understand that in the Bible says, in the Spirit, he was carried to a wilderness. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 3. The Bible says, so he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. All right? Is there a wilderness in heaven? Okay, gotcha. And I saw, I put this word horao out there, a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That's an ugly looking woman. All right, seven heads. We have not. <laughs> the word says, I saw is not talking about seeing physically. The word horao means discern. So guess what? Not only is John experiencing heaven in the spirit, he's also experiencing the other world in the spirit. And you got to understand one thing. What John, you have to realize, for you to discern what is God and what is not God, guess what you need? You need the Holy Spirit. Come on, church, y'all need to help me out here this morning. Otherwise, this sermon is going to be a little farther than you expected. If you want to discern the other spirit from the Holy Spirit, what you need? The Holy Spirit. If you want to see if that man is for you or against you, no matter how cute and he's doing stuff with his biceps and his chest and all that other stuff, if you want to discern things, guess what you need? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. Church, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you have any intention of going to heaven, you have to understand that you ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The problem that we have in the church today is the fact that people think that the Holy Spirit is only about speaking in tongues. Absolutely, you ought to speak in the tongues. But I will tell you one thing. Speaking in tongues is just the foot in the doorstep of the Holy Spirit. There are greater things that you can do, greater things that you can know, greater things that you can see, greater things that you can hear if you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you got to understand one thing. Don't come to church to get the Spirit. You know, people get the, oh, when we got up there, you know, we, we got in the Spirit. You don't get in the Spirit. The Spirit ought to get you, child of God, because you got to understand one thing. You need the Spirit of God to take a breath, just like the young lady sang this morning, saying, Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. How do we understand the need and understand the presence of the Holy One in our lives, it is through the 
Somebody give God glory in this house this morning for the Holy Spirit of God this morning. Now, having said that, what are we going to do in heaven that we need to practice on earth? The Bible says, now I know what you all are thinking. You're thinking, oh my God, I can't wait. I'm just going to go to heaven and heaven is going to be beautiful. I'm going to have a halo. I'm just doing that all the time. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to get a little crown, all that stuff. I'm just going to be doing that. Uh, there is, and again, please don't go by what I say. I'm just going to go tell you that there is theology that, that can back up that you've got to do some work when you are in heaven. The difference is that this is not in a, a work that is brought out of a curse that we see in the Garden of Eden. Remember how the Garden of Eden, the curse fell and you ought to work? The work in heaven, and I, there's all scriptures backing up. I'll give that to you in a minute here. But I'll tell you one thing. There's going to be work. So guess what? If you're lazy here, I don't think heaven will hire you. Number two thing that you're going to be doing is that you're going to be ruling in heaven. Remember the scripture that we talked about? The fact that you had realized that one thing, that if you're faithful over little things, that you'll be made governor of what? Greater things. In other words, how do you rule in heaven? Is it with an iron fist? How do you rule in heaven? You rule in heaven just as God would rule in heaven. With justice, with mercy, and with love. In other words, if you're a jerk here, I just, I'm, just, I'm a nice guy, really am. Um, if you're a jerk here, chances of you being wanted to be hired or vote, and I'm not going to, there's no voting there, but put in a position of authority, highly unlikely. All right, so be nice to people. You might be, like, like he said to Abraham, you might, be, you might be dealing with angels of heaven. Remember how Abraham, how he treated the three men, and one of them was God. Remember that whole story? And he was treating what? Treating angels. All right, so you never know, I might be an angel. Y'all laughing, I can't believe y'all. Okay, now having said that, you've got to understand that there's, that is the two things that you've got to understand that you'll be doing in heaven. All those are important, and I have no intention to go much more further, but there is a third thing that we're going to be doing. You know what we're going to be doing in heaven? Worship. We are going to be worshiping in heaven. So when you pray, saying, the Lord, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, my, it, my, my, my desire to tell you, according to the unction of the Holy Spirit, is this, that God wants you to learn how to worship here before you get up there. I want to give kudos to our worship team because every single day around 8 o'clock in the morning, they come in here and they start practicing. You know, praise, did the praise team just do an amazing job today? woo <laughs> we Now, the praise team comes in here to do what? Rehearsal. All right? Is it just to, is it, hey, but hold on. They're talented. They're amazed. They're, they're um, well-talented. They're anointed. They've got it all going. I'm telling you, the oil of God is just flowing down them. It's all amazing and stuff. Why do they have to practice? If they're so good at what they do, why practice? Because the show is about to come, and there's a level of excellence that is expected. There are some days that I will tell you one thing that Jansen, is he in the, are you in the Jansen room? Oh, he's in the back. He's such a jerk to these people. I hide in the office because, yes, yes, you are going to take it in a G, Jansen. And he's hard on them because there's a level of excellence that is expected. Now, when you come to worship in the house of God, you are here for a rehearsal. When you come for rehearsal, you have to understand there is a level of excellence that is expected in heaven that you are to practice on earth. That means when you come into the house of God, you are not just going to come in like, let me see what they got today. 
Ah, let me see with it. No, child of God, you got to understand one thing. When you walk, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates. That doesn't mean I'm going to come into his courts and let me see what they got and I'll give you something back. But the Bible says like that. I will enter his courts with praise and with thanksgiving in my heart. Child of God, you got to understand one thing. Before you get to heaven, there are some things that you and I got to understand about worship that is on this earth and you and I better get it straight before we get to heaven it ain't about your chord or your pitch that you got to sing but you got to understand one thing there is a heart of excellence that we do as unto the lord there's a small few pointers that we have i want to cover real quick i have about 20 more minutes that's on my clock not on your clock um my 20 minutes may be a little longer than your clock turned 20 minutes. But there are three, th few things that I want to show from, from, from the book of Revelation of what worship is like in heaven. But you've got to understand one thing. Remember, on earth as it is in heaven. So the worship that we're going to offer in heaven that we see in the book of Revelation is going to give you a glimpse of what your worship ought to look like here. Are we good? Are we ready for God's journey? First and foremost, let us go to the book of Revelation chapter number one verse number four through six revelation chapter number one verse number four through six the bible says like this john to the seven churches which are uh in asia grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from understand those seven spirits Okay, the, if you go back to the thing, uh, the seven spirits, a capital S. So this is not a false spirit, but it's a spirit of what? Heaven, all right? Who are before his throne and, and, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings to the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion. Someone said dominion. Dominion forever and ever. You got to understand one thing. John is introducing himself as a brother. Like I told you before, he's in the Isle of Patmos all by himself. And he's trying to tell you one thing, that we are all in the struggle together. In other words, you know what? Just like I'm in the Isle of Patmos, the church has some issues as well. I have been thrown here. There are times that you will also be thrown out of fellowship with your loved ones at that time. But in that words, he says, his words in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ points to the fact that that even though that I am in a crazy situation, I am in a bad situation, guess what? Worship still belongs to Jesus Christ because he is not in the same position that I am. He is in the position of authority. You know, sometimes people say that worship is emotional. No, it's not. Worship is intentional. In other words, sometimes you just got to tell your flesh, uh-uh, you ain't going to act up on me today. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be upon my lips. I, I, was, I was going to go for Psalm 103. I, I'm just skipping my, my, my memory right now. Yes. What was that again? Bless the Lord, that's what I was going to, yeah. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is what? Within me. In other words, what David is telling is like this. Flesh. I have made up my mind that I'm going to bless the Lord. And since I have authority, I am going to tell all of me that we are all going to be on the same page today. I might have a headache, we're going to be on the same page today. I might have a leg cramp, I'm going to be on the same page today. I might feel like my arthritis is acting up, I'm going to be on the same page today. I feel like my back is giving out, I'm going to be on the same page. What in the world is she wearing? I'm going to be on the same page today. Oh my God, what? what I am going to be on the same page today. Worship is authoritative. 
And that worship is authoritative where you have to have control over what? Yourself. And for you to have authority over yourselves, your flesh has to die and your spirit has to take over. All right? Now, having said that, I love, I, I'm, I'm just going to pick on Sister Thurman for a second because I love picking on her. She's going to throw a stone at me later. One thing I like about her, for it's been five years, five, five years, I mean, every, almost every Sunday, that lady comes in here with a praise in her mouth. Even for stupid stuff, she says, amen. <laughs> Your pastor's a jerk. She's like, amen to that. And for the good stuff, she says, amen to that too. You know why? No one has to rile her up. No one's got to wind her up like a little cuckoo thing and fix it up and wind her so that she can go around and say amen. Let me tell you something, child of God. You've got to understand one thing, that God has given authority over your flesh. Now, you also got to understand one thing. How does it resemble heaven? It resembles heaven in the fact that Jesus is seated on the throne. And when Jesus is seated on the throne, you also got to realize there are some other spirits that are on the earth that are trying to affect your worship. And let me tell you something. There are things that will come into your mind that might be legitimate reasons. Hey, I don't know how I'm going to pay my electric bill tomorrow. It might be legitimate things that the devil will bring and put in your mind. But you got to understand one thing. When the devil comes in with all his power, and authority and strength what you ought to do is ought to be like John and tell and look and put a glimpse upon the throne of Jesus Christ and say to yourself I know I got some hell to deal with when I get out of here but while I am in the house of God I have made up my mind that I am going to worship the living King the living God the living Lord and guess what I know one thing at his throne every knee shall bow every tongue shall confess epb you ain't got nothing on my jesus tennessee water you ain't got nothing on my jesus arthritis you ain't got nothing on my god hey funny acting family you ain't got nothing upon the throne of jesus christ because worship is authoritative when you praise god you're releasing authority what kind of authority are we talking about? I'm talking about the authority that comes with the throne of Jesus. See, when I am in authority, now let me tell you something. Now, have you ever seen, have you ever been to traffic court? About three of y'all. The most sanctified church this side of the Mississippi. I'll tell you, I've been to traffic court, they know me by my first name. Uh, all the way from, from Chattanooga to back to Lilburn. They, they, they every, and I'm just messing. Um, and guess what? Have you ever seen the judge? If 90% of the judges that I've come, I've gone to court with, if they were to put me in a fight, I just have to punch once. It's over. A little itty bitty guy, old, just like, just can't. If I were to see him in an alley and punch him, he's, it'd be done. But guess what he does? When he walks into the courtroom, he comes in, and God knows what's underneath that robe. Let's just say he's in his shorts. And he puts on this robe. The moment that he puts on that robe, guess what happens? We all, we don't bow down, but, you know, in, in, in the civil court, we're like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why? Because he's got what? Authority. God is not looking at his power. God is looking at his authority. In other words, what do you got to understand? One thing, child of God, is this. You might look like you're a weakling in the presence of the enemy. You might look like you're a weakling in the presence of all the stuff that's going on. You might wonder, Lord, how am I going to make it? This ain't going to happen. How is this going to happen? All that stuff. But you got to understand one thing, child of God. While you're looking at your power and you're looking at your wall of power and your mental power, God is saying, take your mind off of the power and put your mind on the authority that you have. I have given you authority to trample on, 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 to tread upon snakes and to trample upon scorpions. I have given you authority that when you pray out to the, on, 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 to a sick man, he or she would be healed. I have given you authority to do this and to do that. Child of God, let me tell you something. When you stand in the house of God and you are worshiping the almighty God, there's not just words of praise that comes in, but there is a certain level of authority that 
that's being released into the atmosphere that you have to realize one thing that God is going to show up in all his power and all his majesty in all his strength and glory and honor and every devil that is trying to shut you down has to shut himself up in the throne of Jesus Christ every one of those has to happen but you got to understand one thing worship don't happen on Sunday worship happens every day the church is all about coming to, to the house of God like okay let, let me just get my worship on no Turn your worship on all day, all night. Even in the middle of the night, you should ought to have your worship. It's not the praise team's job to come and tell you, lift your hands to do this and do this or do that. No, 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 no. This ain't no exercise. This ain't no uh, 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 exercise video that we're trying to sell. You've got to understand one thing. When you come into the house of God, you already got your worship on, but you've got to understand one thing. You have to have a life of worship in your prayer closet. You have to have a life of worship in your bathroom closet. You should have a life of worship in your car. You are to have a life of worship right there on I-24 and I-75, that little interchange, you better have some worship. We better have some worship when we're driving through Atlanta. We, you, know, you, you better have your worship at all times because you got to understand one thing. When you have your worship mode on, which is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's exactly what you're going to be doing in heaven is to give him worship at all times. Worship is authoritative next thing you got to understand is this the bible says in revelation chapter number five verse number eight through ten the bible says now when he had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp and golden bowls of incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song hold, hold, hold on. If you can't sing new songs here, you're going to have a hard time up there. Just saying. Um, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God. And by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall do what? Reign on the earth when we go to the book of revelation chapter number five there's a problem you know what the problem is the problem is that there's a scroll that needs to be opened up and john the revelator is looking all around to find out exactly who is going to open up the scroll he looks around and he looks around and he sees elders and he sees living creatures. He sees this and he sees that. Not a single person is lifting up to go, standing up to go open up that scroll. As a matter of fact, no one is even moving their finger. If anything, they might be looking around to see, hey, who is going to open up the scroll? Who is going to open up the scroll? And right then the Bible says that John was about to get sad because no one was about to open up the scroll. And the Lamb of God, he rises up and he goes over over to the scroll and he takes up the scroll and he opens up the scroll that was handed to him by God. The word of God says that he was the lamb of God that opened up this particular scroll. And as soon as Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, rose up to open up the scroll, there was a new song that they were going to sing. It was not just a song that everybody's going to sing, but guess what? The elders rose up and the elders said, one thing we have found something new you know what something that we heaven has not experienced until this very moment in time and what is that new experience and that new experience is this that the elders stand up to sing a song I want to tell man I will tell you one thing when elder Russell and elder Blake gets up in this house and they start worshiping I'll tell you one thing they change the admin I'm not trying to praise them or do anything along those lines but I'll tell you there's something that comes up with the eldership of a church of our house and also in heaven but let me tell you something you got to understand what the bible says like this that they fell down and they sang a new song and they said you are sorry they they stood fell down upon the land each having a harp they were playing some instruments music is part of heaven and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints 
I would tell you one thing, child of God. Let me tell you something. Last night, I had a sermon ready to go. around, All ready to go. All I needed to do was do finishing touches. But guess what? The Holy Spirit really messed me up up and guess what he changed a few things about this sermon so i have every intention to tell you exactly what the holy spirit has given to me to tell you you know what i usually go to sleep around two o'clock in the morning but last night i went to sleep around four in the morning because you know what i love the word when the word messes me up before it messes you up you know what the bible says like this that the elders rose up and they had a harp in their hand and not only did they have a harp in their hand they had a golden bowls of incense what is this golden bowl of incense this golden bowls of incense is your prayer it's my prayer it's our prayer you know sometimes I've always wondered God how many times am I going to knock on your door and bother you for the same thing how many times I'm going to stand here and pray how many times am I going to do that well guess what the Holy Spirit told me last night you got to understand one thing child of God your prayer is not a pain in heaven but your prayer is a part of heaven let me say again your prayer is not a pain in heaven heaven but rather it is a part in heaven if you don't pray you're stealing from heaven yeah. and all of a sudden the prayers that we offered up it goes into heaven and guess what they do they're pouring it out you know as what as incense the same prayer where you said life will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That heaven was released when you are pouring out this prayer before the Lamb of God. And then the elders start to sing. I love this song. The elders start to sing like this. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its scrolls. Why? Because you were slain. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Guess what the elders got to say? As beautiful as heaven is. As gorgeous as heaven is. As, 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 as beautiful as the streets of gold would be. They have found something greater than what heaven is all about. Heaven is not just about the streets of gold. Heavens is not about the angels standing in all with all their power. The heavens are not just about seeing your loved ones and Abraham and Noah and Moses and all of these things. But let me tell you something. Heaven is about one thing. And you know what heaven is all about? Heaven is about you seeing the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Why? Because worship is missional and reconciliatory. You got to understand one thing. What is this worship about? We are trying to tell the elders are saying, hey, you are worthy because you were slaughtered you are worthy because you were killed on the tree of the cross of calvary number two he is saying you are worthy because you purchased me let me tell you something i always tell you there are two beings you can't lie to you about your mess that is you and god and the two people are right standing right in front at this moment and you got to say one thing that you got to realize one thing hey when i think about the price that you paid to wash me to cleanse me to beautify me to bring me into heaven to cleanse me put me up with a white robe and stand in the in next to the elders of heaven stand next to the angels of heaven and above all standing next to jesus christ i have to say god what price you have paid to redeem me he was slaughtered and he purchased and guess what he made us Kings. Let me tell you something. I don't have enough degrees on the wall to be a king. I don't have people in my family that look like a king, talk like a king, or quack like a king. They don't even sleep like a king. Majority of my family don't even have a king size bed. I ain't got nothing to do with kings. And guess what? When he breaks me, the Bible says, you know what? He made me. In other words, the same creation that he did in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to get a little out here. That mud.
lifts me up. does he doesn't throw me away he picks me up with all my dirt and all my filth and all my sin and you know what he says I've made you king I've made you king I've made you a priest but God I'm not worthy I'm not worthy Yes, you are, when you are in my hands. The world might say that you are a mess, that you're a piece of poop. The world might say that you are all that and then some, but you're in my hands, and I have made you a priest and a king to serve before me. Now you got to understand one thing. be a king and a priest and puts me to the corner. I look around. He takes another one. The man or woman does not look like me. He ain't brown or she ain't brown. He might be black or white or Filipino or Pocahontas. And guess what he's got to say or she's got to say? I'm not worthy. I got some stuff on my resume, God. I'm not worthy. I can't. He says, you know what? You couldn't down there, but you're up here now. The Bible tells us that worship is missional and reconciliatory. You, you cannot get along with other people on this earth, regardless of their color, their creed, regardless of their skin color, their situation, regardless if they're poor, regardless of any of those things, you've got to understand one thing, you will not make it to heaven. I'm going to do something odd right about now. When we were worshiping this morning, God showed me a picture. There were Hispanics on the stage. There were black people on the stage. There's a white redhead back there special prayer for those guys. And then there's a brown Indian on this stage. This is what heaven looks like. That's why I tell you that there is no brown church, white church, or black church. We are all the same church bought by the precious blood of the Lamb. We are a red church. And if you and I have issues based on how a person looks, smells, what their status might be, you and I will not make it to heaven. And while I say that the worship is missional and reconciliatory, you also got to understand one thing. Worship is also about you. It's true that Jesus died for people from every tribe, every nation, every color. But it's you and I, you and I, that brought them to Jesus. While worship is reconciliatory, it's also missional because you've got to understand one thing. It is about you and I as well. It is a moment of celebration that we can say, hey, you don't look like me, you don't quack like me, don't eat like me, don't sleep like me, but guess what? because of me, because of you, it's because of the church that the entire world has come together. When you speak the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone, it's worship. 
when you tell people about how much Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, it is worship. I might not know how many people I have been used to bring, bring to Christ, but when I get to heaven, and Jesus is wiping off all their stains and making them kings and priests. I believe that I have a role in that too. But worthy is a lamb who has been slain on the cross of Calvary. Last but not least, when the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, 7 verse 15 through 17, the Bible says like this, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When we read Revelation chapter 7, you got to understand this is not talking about the church, but this is talking about the new church. What are you talking about, the new church? During the time of the great tribulation, there is still going to be evangelistic work here. People are going to wish that they would die, but they would not die. They will get another chance to hear the voice of Jesus. And they will become, hear the voice of Jesus. They will repent. They'll reconcile. And at that time, there'll be a second rapture for the church that was bought and redeemed, made new during the time of the great tribulation. They will come to heaven. And when they come to heaven, guess what? The elders are going to stand around. They're going to ask the question, who, who, who are these folk? Where did these folk come from? They're walking in there with white robes, looking spiffy, just like they belong. Elders will ask, who are these people? And the Lord will say that, you know what? It's my people. See, for the longest time, I was one to think, that I would want to go at the part of the rapture of Jesus Christ, the first rapture, I want to do that. That's the best way to go so that you don't have to go through the tribulation. Then after that, a group of people will be brought up to heaven from a, from a, from a mindset of, the, of humans. You would think they're second class. That they didn't come with the first time around. They, you know, someone had to stuff Jesus down there, throw it one more time for them to come up there. So that the original church will never say that. Guess what Jesus does? stand in the midst of this new church and he's going to sit on that throne and they're going to say one thing see the first church that came these folk any different are not any different they just came a little late but they're not any different they are not going to get hungry or thirsty nor would they want anything that they need for their daily stuff. Remember how Jesus said, when you are to pray, give us our daily on earth as it is in heaven. And guess what? At that very moment in time, the whole thing is that the church will be brought up together. And the Bible says like this, now there is no difference between the original people and this people. They are one. Worship is the great equalizer. And then he says that I will wipe every tear away from their eyes. Whose eyes? The church. Now there is no first church and second church. There is only the church. I will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Child of God, I want to tell you one thing. That when you are in this world, there are times in your life where you would feel like you're a nobody. You would feel like you are not qualified for this, that, and the other. When you look at your family, when you look at other people, when you look at other situations, you would think that they got it better than you. Lord, I have been serving you all this time. Is this what I get? Lord, I've been doing this all of my life. Is this what I get? Look how the wicked are reigning. Look how the wicked are flourishing. Is this what I get? But let me tell you something. When you come into the house of God and you decide to worship God, guess what happens? Just like the ones that you were concerned about, that you were comparing yourself to, 
God says, I got your back. You will not hunger no more, neither will you thirst no more. You will not need anything anymore. As a matter of fact, everything that you have been crying about, I, God, myself, will come and wipe away. I'm not going to send Gabriel to do that. I'm not going to send Michael to do that. I, myself, will come down and wipe away every tear. When you come to worship, I don't care what the devil says about you. I don't care what he's been whispering in your head, whispering in your ear. I don't care what they've been saying. Let me tell you something. When you come into the house of God, when you go into your worship closet, when you go into a place of worship, guess what? It is not the devil who speaks in your worship room. It is God himself who comes down and speaks on your behalf in the area of your worship. Because you got to understand one thing. As weak as you might be, as lonely as you might be, as lowly as you might be, when you come into the house of God and you offer up a worship, heaven comes down on your behalf. Now here comes the kicker. That's what worship is like in heaven. What's your worship going to be like here? I want to tell you one thing. I'm just being blunt. Over the course of the five years, the hardest area that I have been hit is not finances. The hardest area we've been hit is in the worship realm. It was hard to get people that understand God, that feel God, that live for God. I'm not telling all our struggles are over, but I'm telling you one thing that I'm going to prophesy to Hope City Church as your pastor. The day worship is being restored in this house as it is in heaven, your house, your street, your block, your city, your county, your state will be changed for the good. But here's the catch. The key is in your hands. The key to worship is in your hands. It's a choice that you have to make. Next Sunday, nobody should walk in here and tell you, hey, everybody worship now. And the following Sunday, the same thing. That means you have not been filling your cup over the course of the last one week. Worship is not about just singing songs that we, that, that, that we know. Songs are supposed to help you fulfill the assignment that you came into the house of God, that you came into the house of God in the first place. Songs help you. I look like I'm going to use you as a prop. I want to tell you one thing. Worship that is brought forth because your pastor said so, praise and worship leader said so, I believe is not acceptable. Nowhere does it say in the Bible, in all of heaven, that someone had to prod them to sing. If you need prodding here, then you're going to need prodding there. And there's no one to proud over there, brothers. This is the great choir rehearsal right here, right now. Here it is. The challenge has been issued. Who is willing to worship God without any fear, any hesitation, no reservation? Arthritis is not a reservation, church. Issues is not a reservation. Clock is not a reservation. How many of you are willing to stand right here, right now? I want to say, you know what, I'm going to do a roll call. I don't have a problem if you sit, but how many of you are willing to say that I am coming into the house of God and I'm going to give it all? 
I'm going to give it my all, my everything. Don't, don't think that you're going to get a brownie points because you stand up. You're making a vow towards heaven. You're making a vow towards heaven and saying, Lord, here I am as I am. I am here to worship you with everything that I've got. Everything that I have, would you please? I don't care how tired or weak you might be with that feeble strength that you got. If you're making a commitment to say, I'm a worshiper, stand up to your feet and let's give God some glory in this house this morning. Come on, church. Let's give God some glory. Let's not back up and back out, but let's stand up and stand in the courts of heaven and give God a praise unlike any other. Hallelujah.